And it's covered by something known as a cerebral cortex, which consists of gray matter. And anytime you see gray matter, neuron cell bodies is what I want you to be thinking about. Also, some glial cells and blood vessels are present as well. This mediates the brain's most complex functions and, and really is what separates us from most um, anim other animals in, on the planet. The white matter that we have underneath the cortex, uh, myelinated axons, that doesn't get old. Um, the convolutions that we have, and, and this is really important that you understand this, the convolutions that we have throughout the telencephalon increase the surface area to volume ratio. And that is a really common trend you're gonna see in evolution. My advice for anyone, if you wanna do anything medical or anything clinical, is to take a, a course on the evolution of vertebrates because when you do that, you learn about a lot of really unique novel strategies. You learn why the structures are the way that they are rather than just learning what they are and what they do. So this increase in surface area enables the brain to do its job without taking up so much so much space, which is, is nice not just in terms of energy efficiency, but is nice in terms of um, you know, reproducing and all other things that could come along with it. Anyways, it's further divided up into a right and left hemisphere um, via these things called fissures. Um, and there's large uh, convulsions, we call that a fissure, as small as a sulci, and then the ridge between the two are known as gyri. All right, so here's a picture showing the longitudinal fissure. Um, right here, there's a, what is it, the central fissure here, a lateral fissure. We'll talk about the corpus callosum, I think, later. Um, Precentral gyrus, this is just showing you an illustration about the parts of the brain and, and, and how we divide up that, that cortex there. Okay, so the longitudinal fissure separates the two hemispheres and it's connected by the corpus callosum. I think in, in, in your introductory psychology classes where they talk about this, people who had really bad seizures ended up getting their corpus callosum surgically cut um, and that helped show that there is, is a lot of difference cognitively between the right and left uh, sides of the brain. What's interesting to me is that they asked them a question, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they would say, like firemen, and they would write down police officer. So there's a lot of just can of worms that that opened up that <laughs> uh, was a result of, of, of this experiments with cutting the corpus callosum. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to mention on the terms of the lobe, we have the frontal, the parietal, occipital, and temporal. This is the frontal lobe. And this plays a role in a lot of voluntary movement. The primary motor cortex can be found here but also the a lot of higher level cognition that we're happening you know the ability to project consequences from current actions um, definitely helped play a role in uh, our survival there um different determination of similarities and differences between things or events um, also uh, in integrating longer non-task based memories that are going to be stored across the brain um, a, a lot of history happened in, into the in terms of just human evolution because of this frontal lobe here Frontal lobe. There's also the precentral gyrus, which contains the primary motor, uh, motor cortex, which we're talking about right here. Um, it's highly developed, and you know, the ability to make tools in terms of human evolution was a huge advantage, and that ability is still with us today. So I always think about the brain surgeon, what his brain would look like. Well, if you're able to do brain surgery, then his precentral gyrus, it must be very, very well developed in order for him to, to, to operate. Okay, so that's it for the frontal lobe. Now the parietal lobe, I'm not gonna talk too much about that. All that I want you to know is that at the postcentral gyrus is the somatosensory cortex. And I think there's a really nice picture. Ah, here we go. So this is kind of a disturbing, like goofy, weird looking picture showing both the precentral gyrus here in, in the, the pink, and then the post-central gyrus in the blue. Um, on the, you know, the pink we have the motor and then the sensory formation. And what this diagram is showing you in terms of like size, that has to do with how specialized we become. So look at how, how much more developed the hands are in terms of sensory, in terms of muscle precision, in terms of motor precision, as opposed to say that of your shoulder or your knee, okay? Um, I don't know if you ever noticed this with kids, but before kids can write, they write um, really holding the uh, marker like in their fists and just move by their shoulder. And then as they get older, they're, you know, they begin to develop much more uh, finer motor skills in the hands. And that is such a huge part of our evolution. I just feel like that's so important. Okay, for the, the occipital lobe, this plays a role in visual information through that optic chiasma that we already talked about. And um, one of the things that's a really good sign that someone has had a pretty severe head injury or a concussion is if they saw a flash of red. And the reason why is, is if you could imagine this being in a skull, whenever damage happens to the skull, 
or happens to the head, that bounces off of the skull and that presses on the occipital lobe and they see red. And, and that's, that's a sign that they've had some pretty, uh, pretty serious injury done. Temporal lobe um, has some other functions as well. It's not just auditory cortex, but this is something that we know very well. Other things are kind of speculative at this point, and I mean speculative in that it's not published in textbook. It's been published in a lot of papers. But for now, temporal lobe, just think about the auditory cortex. Okay, so the telencephalon, of what we just talked about, 90% of that is considered neocortex, you know, new cortex. It's very recent in terms of evolution. And it consists of this six-layered, uh, you know, area with various amounts of density uh, and cell sizes at various locations. It's very thick at areas of the motor, you know, the fine motor cortexes and things like that. Um, there are two types of neurons that kind of helped give this, uh, give rise to this. And your textbook did a shit job of explaining this. There wasn't a very detailed description of it. They just listed them, but they didn't tell what they did. And I didn't like that. So I looked at my anatomy and physiology textbook, and then I also went online and looked. So there's pyramidal cells and then stellate cells. And if you could see this, it actually looks like kind of a pyramid <clears throat> like structure there. And these are really large neurons uh, with an, a big apical dendrite that's extending from the apex of the pyramid. And this plays a large role in complex motor movement and very complex cognition. So what we have with this advancement in circuitry, with this advancement in cognitive abilities, with this advancement in motor skills is an advancement of the underlying circuitry that gives rise to it, okay? Um, there's also, and I don't have a picture of it, of things called stellate cells, which are these small star-shaped interneurons with really no axon that might serve an inhibitory function, but I couldn't find a lot of good or, uh, information about that. One of the things that I really want you to know, as we've talked about with the ascending and descending tracks, is this columnar level of organization. And what this is, is this is just an advanced form of circuitry to give us that advanced form of, you know, very fine motor movement that has enabled us to make tools and surgery and art and all that stuff together. There are, however, a lot of structures in the brain that are not part of that neocortex, sometimes called the primitive cortex, although we've discovered that in terms of, I think the more politically correct term is uh, derived cortex. But anyways, the hippocampus, which plays a large role in memory formation, and then the cingulate cortex, which plays a role in a lot of emotional processing and things like that. The hippocampus, as you can see here, allegedly looks like a seahorse. I, I don't see that, but that's just where the name comes from. The limbic system is, it's the, the word limbic means it's a ring. It's just this little ring-like structure that goes around the thalamus. We'll look at some pictures of it later. And it controls the four Fs. Fighting, fleeing, feeding, and fornication. And sometimes professors think it's funny to imply another word. I don't really think that that's funny. It's not a good joke. Anyways, it consists of the primitive cortex, which we just listed, not the neocortex, right? And then the subcortical structures as well. Primitive cortex consists of the hippocampus and then the cingulated cortex. Um, so for the subcortical structures, we have mammillary bodies, the amygdala, the fornix, and then the septum. Okay. So the amygdala is very important in emotional responses, particularly fear. And what we found is that it plays a role in, in working with the hippocampus to initiate that when you have uh, something that is, is very scary, to make sure that you remember that so that you know, you know, in terms of natural selection, not to go back to that area or to stay away from that type of animal or to, you know, just avoid those situations altogether. Um, the hippocampus, as we just previously had mentioned, plays a role in memory formation. The cingulate cortex in uh, Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint keeps uh, replacing this word, so I probably spelt it wrong. Um, but this plays a little role in pain perception as well as emotion. The septum, also emotional behavior, and then the fornix connects the mammillary bodies, recollective memory, to the hippocampus. Okay, so here we see that purple thing there is the fornix. Okay, the thing that you're seeing there, again, it's supposed to look like a seahorse, hippocampus, right? Here's the amygdala, the mammillary bodies, there's the septum, and then this is the uh, left and right uh, cingulate cortex. Part is the basal ganglia, and all of these parts of the basal ganglia together collectively come to, to play a role in controlling voluntary movement, okay? So the amygdala is also a part of the basal ganglia. It's, it has multiple functions. The globi, globus pallidus, ugh, talk about difficult names here, the striatum, and then the substantia nigra. And this is really important in terms of Parkinson's disease. Um, these are the illustrations showing you the pictures of it. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about Parkinson's disease because 
Um, a gentleman right here by the name of Gregory Petsko did an amazing eye biology podcast where he talks in depth about the discovery of Parkinson's disease, the path of physiology, and how we could treat it. And it is probably the best thing I've seen on the internet in a long time. Him and then a woman by the name of Susan Lindquist out at MIT show that it's really just um, you can think of it as oxidative stress or you can think of it as a protein folding problem. I would encourage you to watch it. I'll put a link to it in the, the description or link to it in the next video in this playlist.